So before we put any paint on this dreadnought, I'm going to have to give it a dust. Old dust on miniatures when you paint them causes a big mess, and we don't want that. Luckily, it only takes a few seconds. My name's Marcel, and this is Snakeworks. Now, eagle-eyed viewers might notice that the dreadnought was once blue. But that's because it was originally going to be a Night Lord's dreadnought. But if you've been following along with this Horus Heresy painting series, you probably already know that. But here's a link to the series, if you are new here and want to see just what has gone on in the past. Let's move on, shall we? So, for my first base colour, I'm going to use Vallejo Game Colour Cold Grey. I was going to use Basalt Grey, but I still can't find it. Then, using my airbrush, I applied this colour to the entire miniature. I wanted a nice solid coat of this colour to work from. After a couple of minutes struggling to use an airbrush on camera, I had this, a rebase coated Contemptor Dreadnought. Are you sad the blue colour has gone? Now some people are still a little bit upset that I binned off the Night Lords. But I think at the end of this video, I think you will agree that we went down a better road. Okay, so our next paint up on the line is Vallejo model colour light grey. Can you see the rust in there? Let's hope it doesn't affect the paint too much. Using my airbrush, I then apply this to the dreadnought. I apply it from the top, front, backs and the sides, but not from underneath. We want the previous layer as our shadow. When that's done, we have this. So far, it just looks like it's primed with grey car paint, doesn't it? Oh well, let's sort that out next, shall we? Now, word on the street is that Halford's grey spray primer in an aerosol is actually pretty damn good for miniatures. But I myself have never tried it. Have any of you? And if you have, is it any good? Right, so here comes our game-winning paint. Vallejo model colour white. I'm using white as I want the miniature to be white. This time I concentrate my airbrushing to the top down and from a top left downwards angle onto the miniature and I don't know if that makes any sense but what I am trying to do is have a consistent light source as it were. When that's all applied you have this. You can see what I meant about the light source on his belly there. The underneath is in shadow, the above is not. See? Simples. Damn, I hate those meerkat adverts. Are they still a thing? I think I've got one of the free plushy ones around here somewhere that came free with an insurance policy. Must have been around 10 years ago. So on this scheme, I want some blue panels, but I'm not sure which blue I wanted to use. To help me decide, I made a little swatch thing. I went with dark blue for the base, with magic blue for my highlights. Wonderful. Using the dark blue, I then applied this to all the panels I wanted to be blue. I tried my best to be neat at this stage, as we don't want blue on our nice white parts. It seems we got lucky and didn't get blue anywhere we didn't want it. That means we can move on. Now, if I had got a bit of blue on an area of white where I didn't want it, I think we'd have to go back to the white and repaint it by hand. I do apologise, you can see my armpit hair today by the way, because it is quite warm outside, hence I'm wearing a vest. Uh, Miami Dolphins, that well-known famous basketball team, which I'm pretty sure is an American football team, but they now do a basketball vest. Anyway, so yeah, I was saying I'd have to repaint a white area white if I had got any blue on it. And I don't enjoy revisiting areas I've already painted. So I'm glad we didn't do that. Now World Eaters, or these uh, Warhounds, seem to enjoy the odd red stripe here and there. So the red I'm going to use is Vermilion Red. And apparently it has something to do with worms. Using a nice pointy brush, I painted a little stripe onto the Dreadnought's head. Again, I tried my absolute best to not get red paint anywhere it wasn't wanted. And here we have the results of that. 
eagle-eyed viewers will notice I didn't paint the stripe far back enough so you can see where it ends on the top of the head. Now at one point, I wasn't going to worry too much about that stumpy stripe, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. They prey on your mind, don't they, these mistakes? Even though hardly anyone would ever notice. So you will see how we sort that out later on. Basically, we just finish it. Okay, so next up we have to highlight that blue. What I did was add increasing amounts of the magic blue into the dark blue and painted smaller and smaller areas of the panels towards the edges, giving me a gradient of sorts. It was pretty easy to do, but I did try to pay special attention to where I think the light would be hitting. After all that was said and done, we had this. You can now see some nice transitions on the panels, and I think it looks quite nice myself. Now upon revising this footage, I think I could have gone even further with those blue highlights. Maybe next time we can pick a slightly brighter blue. What do you guys think? Was it bright enough? Can we go further? Next up, we need to do some gloss varnishing. I'm using this Vallejo gloss varnish as it's nice to airbrush with. Can you see the drips running down the box at the back of the shot? Weird. Using my airbrush and the varnish with just a touch of thinner, I then gave the Dreadnought a damn good glossing. This is the first gloss layer, so try not to make it too thick and gloopy. When the varnish is applied and dry, you have this. You can see the gloss effect better on those blue panels like up there on the shoulders. Now one thing I've noticed with my beady eyes is that gloss varnish, this is gloss varnish now by the way, appears to make your colours look darker. So if after this stage it doesn't look quite right, that's the reason why. But don't worry, just trust the process and carry on. So I'm going to be adding some decals. I cut all the decals I wanted to use out of a decal sheet. This one was generously gifted to me by a friend. Thank you very much for that, John. And I do need these little doggies. I then put the decals in a waterproof container and dripped some water onto them to begin the process. I try not to use too much water as not to make a mess. After a while, the decals separate from the backing and they begin to slide around. Be careful with them as they are fragile. A bit like me after a couple of shandies. Now, I like to do something else while I wait for my decals to dry. Reply to a few comments on videos, for example. I do try my best to reply to you all. Oh, if you are paying attention, please leave a comment right now and say, I was paying attention. I then bring the decal to the miniature and slowly slide it off onto the panel where I want it. It helps to put a bit of water on the panel too, but I didn't film that because I'm an idiot. Using a poking device, you can then tease the decal into your desired final position. As I'm doing this one doggy style, I wanted the dog in prime position on the big leg panel. It was pretty easy to stick it right where I wanted to be fair. Next, I roll up some toilet paper into a little tube and wick away any excess water. This prevents the decals wandering around the miniature, which can happen if you're not paying attention. Trust me, I know. Now, when Mrs. Snakeworks saw that I was rolling up a piece of paper, she thought I was rolling joints. But I leave that job to Zack. And as Zack would say, Walk off. If you know, you know. So next I grab my pot of decal softener. This one is called Microsol. Apparently it's not on sale anymore. So if anyone can recommend an alternative that is on sale, please let us all know in the comments below. Using a brush, I then gently apply a coat of the decal softener to the decals. This sort of melts the decals a bit and allows them to conform to the shapes and surfaces that they're on. After a few sessions of that, I usually do two or three and let it dry in between, we have this. Luckily, most of the panels are quite flat, so we didn't have many issues. Now, sometimes you get really awkward panels and those decals just do not want to conform. 
It's usually the case with Space Marine shoulder pads. They are notorious for it. You just have to keep adding the microsol or the decal softener over and over until the damn thing goes where you want it. Or take a heat gun to it. But that can end in disaster. Just ask Dean. There's someone outside the window. That might be my stepladder arriving. Remember that gloss varnish we used before? Well now we're going to be using it again. This time we're sealing in those decals. Try not to go overboard with the varnish as you don't want to be filling in any details. After a little while you have a nicely decaled and glossed dreadnought. Now I like to leave it overnight here to let that gloss really harden up. You might be okay moving straight on but I didn't want to take any risks. This week while I was waiting for the varnish to dry I decided to watch some of Louise over at Rogue Hobbies videos. I especially enjoyed the focus on old hammer subjects as it's something I'm quite passionate about and I assume you guys knew that anyway. Here's a link to the channel if you fancy going to have a watch for yourself. It's pretty good. I've not already kind of started doing that. I painted one space marine and that's it. And I painted it as a rainbow warrior, so <laughs> So it's now the time to begin pin washing the dreadnought. I like to use this pre-made pin wash called Panel Line Accent Colour by Tamiyar. It's much easier than making it myself. The pin wash has a convenient little brush applicator thing that's built into the lid so it's proper easy to apply. Just touch it to whatever creases and folds you want that pin wash in. It's really good fun. If it goes where you don't want it, you can just clean it off with some thinners. You can see here I've also done a little weathering by just dragging the wash down the miniature in places. Now I do apologise I didn't show me cleaning up the pin wash and doing that little bit of weathering. Is that a technique that you guys would like to see me do in a future video in the future? If so let me know in the comments below. We now need to mat the miniature back down. And to do that I'm using Windsor and Newton matte varnish. It's nice and matte you see. I then thin this a little and run it through my airbrush. Again I try to apply it in thin layers so it doesn't clog up detail or go frosty or anything. That's always a worry. But take your time and you will be fine. And after that is all done and dry you have this. Have you noticed how the miniature has lightened up again? It doesn't look dark like after the gloss varnish. Very strange. Now while writing my script with my calligraphy pen, I became aware that I was swapping between the terms miniature and dreadnought on a constant basis. And I do apologise for that, especially if it's caused any confusion. It's probably going to continue happening in this video, which I probably shouldn't have told you because you might not have noticed otherwise. Oh well. Ok let's finish off that helmet stripe and get it out of the way. We will use our original vermilion and use a bit of white for mixing this time. I begin by just neatening up with the red paint. I then add a little white to the red, not a lot as we don't want pink and highlight the middle of the stripe. I then add a teeny touch more white for a final highlight inside the very centre of that stripe. After a little bit of work we have this and hopefully it doesn't read as pink. Does it? Now even though I have been painting since the 1940s, I still don't really know how to highlight red. Are there any experts out there that would like to help me with that? What's your best technique? Do you use pink? Do you use orange? Do you use a fist because apparently that's the best thing to do? Fisting my red. Red Fiston, Mephiston, oh dear. Now according to international law you have to black in all the areas you want to paint metallic so let's do that. To paint black we need a black and here's my black, Vallejo model colour black. I thinned the black quite a lot so it went on smooth and begun painting in everything I wanted to be metal. Gun barrels, mechanical watsits, you know the drill. After a fair few minutes we had this. 
We now have a solid base on which we can paint the metals. Does anyone know what happens if you don't pre-base your metals with black paint? Will you be arrested by the hobby police? Or will your hobby area just explode? I daren't take the risk. The metal base colour I like to use is Vallejo Model Air Gun Metal. I prefer the air version as it's a better consistency. The normal stuff just doesn't seem to thin right. I then apply the gun metal to all the areas I wanted metal. Funny that. There were a couple of areas I left though, because I want to paint those ones gold. More on that in a moment. And here's what it looks like with the metal applied. It's starting to come together now, and the finish line isn't looking too far off. Now some people might be upset that I painted the melter gun barrel silver, and not gold. Which a lot of people do. Or yellow, if you like, uh, castanets. Second edition Blood Angels. Anyway, you'll see why I've done them silver in a little while. Or you could just skip to it if you're so inclined. So to break up the silver of the metals, I'm going to add some gold bits. My gold of choice today is Citadel Retributor Gold, a Games Workshop base paint, and I think they still sell this one. I then apply this gold to some other sections, such as the Dreadnought's belt and what look to be fuel canisters of sorts on the weapons, both the melter gun and whatever the other thing is we chose for the fist. I think it's another melter gun. You can see the effect has of breaking up the miniature a little bit. It adds some visual interest, as it were. Now I did wonder if my gold was a little bit too gold. And maybe I should have just used a bronze paint. What do you guys reckon? We now need to give the metal areas a shade. This is always a fun step. I finally bought some more Nuln Oil, and I think this is the new formula. Let's see how it performs. I then applied the Nuln Oil over all the silver bits. I tried my hardest not to let the Nuln Oil pull in areas I didn't want it to. Which is none. We don't like to pull in. Here's the results of the Nuln oiling. You will notice I had to pull the arm off the Dreadnought to access some of its smaller crevices. Luckily the arms were not glued on. I used magnets, you know. Now I cannot believe how long ago it was that I actually built that Content to Dreadnought miniature. It must have been, what, July 2022? That's nearly a year ago. Most people had theirs built and painted within the month of release. And here's me just about finishing mine off now in um, June 2023. As Gandalf would say, I'm sorry Frodo, I was delayed. After a few years, the null oil has dried and we can return to painting. First up, we need the original metal colour back, Gunmetal Air. It sounds like a band. I then reapply the gun metal to all the metal parts, apart from the recesses or areas I just want to leave dark. This has the added effect of tidying blotchy areas up, which is always handy. Next up is my old mate, Vallejo Model Air Chrome. This is a lovely light silver colour. It would be good to paint Terminator Hunter Killers or Endoskeletons with. Fewer painting them, that is, and I'm not. Then using this paint, I sparingly apply it to areas I want highlighted on the metals. I try my best to pay attention to the shapes of the parts and work from there, rather than just the usual edge highlighting we sometimes do. I say I did it, it was more a case of trying to do it. And after the chrome highlights were applied, we have this. The Dreadnought looks like new now, almost like he's been shipped from the factory. Or should I say Forge? Now who exactly builds Space Marine Dreadnoughts? Is it the Mechanicum in their forges? Or is it Space Marine Tech Marines? Uh, this is supposed to be a servo arm, by the way. Or is it both? I don't actually know. To the law books! Oh, by the way, I put an Agrax Earthshade wash on that gold. But somehow I've either lost the footage or never filmed it in the first place. 
I, it. We must pronounce our T's. Let's finish the gold now, shall we? First up, Retributor Gold. We reapply this gold to all the gold areas, leaving the shaded gold in the recesses. Did I mention I added an Agrax Earthshade wash? I don't think I did. To highlight the gold, I take some of that chrome paint as my mixer. Don't put vodka in it though, and that wouldn't be a good idea. Using a mix of the two paints, it gave me a light gold as it were. I'd concentrate on the edges of the gold areas and any bits I wanted highlighting. It's only a minor detail though, so I didn't worry too much about this. Now, my super secret trick to making gold look interesting is to take a little seraphim sepia. What's a seraphim anyway? Isn't it a type of angel or something? Using the seraphim sepia, I then wash all the gold areas with it. This ties all the shaded and highlighted areas together with a nice sepia filter. Easy peasy work. I would show you the end result, but again I've lost the footage or didn't film it. Now if you're of the squeamish persuasion, you might want to look away for the next 30 seconds or so. It's going to get a little scary in here. While we were waiting for the washers to dry, Wyatt and I took a little walk where we found a spider's nest. There's a lot of baby spiders. Off they go. They're having a wonderful time. Little yellow spiders with black bums. A lot of them. With the spiders asked to leave the area, we can continue. It's chipping next, so our first colour for that will be Vallejo Panzer Aces Dark Rust. I have no idea why the tube label looks a lot cheaper than their usual paints, and I hope this one's not a knockoff. Using a brush, you could use a sponge for this, I then painted on some little dark chipped areas around the model. I tried my absolute best not to make it symmetrical and concentrated on areas I felt would most likely be chipped the most. I also tried not to go overboard as I feel overly weathered miniatures look a bit messy to my eye. Your mileage may vary of course. Next up we need a white. I'm going to use some of that Pro Acryl Bold Titanium White. A lot of people say this is the best white paint on the market, and I am still undecided. With the white I then very carefully highlight the bottom of each of those dark chips, giving them a 3D effect as it were. I also do some chips on other areas of the miniature, concentrating on areas I feel would be worn the most again. Again, if you guys feel you want a more in-depth video showing just how I do this, then please let me know. We could probably work it into the uh, Spartan video or something. That's something we still have yet to finish off. We then need our lightest blue that we used as a highlight for our blue areas. In this case, Vallejo Game Color Magic Blue. And I have no idea why the label's all wrinkled up like that. I do that, it's weird. We then do the same thing as before and highlight some of the dark scratches on the blue panels and add a few new ones with this colour. Again, I don't like going overboard with this. With the scratches applied to the blue, our chipping and scratches are complete. Now it looks like my car after I parked it in the local Sainsbury's car park. Fantastic! Now even if I park miles away from anyone on that car park, in a big wide open space, you can be sure some little swine will pull up right next to you and open their door and give you a damn good dent. Because they can't possibly park in another big open area can they? They have to pull up right next to you in a massive open car park. I see you there Ikea plant. It's trying to stab me. Anyway I'm digressing. We're going to do something a little different now. Some muzzle burn or heat bloom on the melter gun's barrels. This is why I didn't paint it gold. I'm using four colours for this, from yellow through to red, to purple, to blue. 
Starting with the yellow, I then coat most of the barrels with this colour. I'm just giving it a thin glaze. I then go in with the red and paint this over the yellow area, but leave a bit of the yellow showing towards the dreadnought end of the weapon. What's the proper term for the non-tip end? Is there one? Hilt end? Handle end? I've no idea. After the red, we then go in with the purple. Again, onto an even smaller area than before. You can already see the effect starting to come together. Like the Beatles song. Or was it Michael Jackson? The last colour we add is blue. This gives us a nice blue effect at the tip of the barrel. That wasn't so hard, was it? And after all those stains or glazes or filters, whatever you want to call them, are all applied, we have this. I think it looks very interesting. Much better than just a normal metal weapon barrel. Oh, I also did the exhausts on the back in the same manner. I'm assuming this heat bloom or heat burn, muzzle burn, whatever the technical term for it is, is down to some sort of chemical reaction in the metal. Now, doesn't it only work with titanium parts or have I misremembered something there? I'm sure a metal expert will be along in the comments below shortly to let us all know. It's the eyes up next and to start, we need some white. In this case, Pro Acryl Bold Titanium White. And I wonder if this one gets heat bloom, you know, being titanium. With this white, I tidy up the inside of the eye sockets. I try to leave the black eyeliner that I got from the pin washing stage. Next up, it's some fluorescent green by Vallejo. Sadly, the fluorescentness doesn't show up well on camera, which is a shame as it's super poppy. Using the fluorescent green, I then paint the eye and a little line underneath it as a little basic OSL effect. It's quite subtle, but it's easy and fast, both words we like over here. We then go back to the white and dot in the centre of that eye at what would be the brightest part of the glow. And with those dots applied, we have this, some glowing green eyes. Oh, you can also see that red stripe isn't quite finished on his hat. Whoops. Now, I was sure I filmed myself finishing off that helmet stripe, but the footage appears to have vanished. But please take my word for it, I did fix it. Honest. You'll see later on. I need the base painted before I can move on, so let's do that, shall we? I need a black, so it's Vallejo Model Black Time. Again with the wrinkly label. What is this all about? Using the black, I then paint the entire base of the Dreadnought. I had to thin it quite a lot to allow it to flow nice and smoothly. Also, I tried my hardest not to get it on the white Dreadnought armour. Luckily, I didn't. We need a highlight colour for the base and the colour shall be Vallejo Light Grey. I'm still missing my Basalt Grey by the way. Vallejo, can you send me some more of that please? Using a dry brush, I then dry brush the base. Again, I tried not to get any of this paint on the Dreadnought's armour and again, I was very lucky. Also, this was quite a heavy dry brush, as in a layer of paint, not the brush itself. The brush is quite light. For the final highlight colour, I shall be using Vallejo model colour white. It's nice and thick, so it should work quite well. Then using that dry brush, I then dry brushed the base again. This time the coat was a lot lighter than the previous layer. It's really showing off that base texture now. It's lovely. For a bit of blending, we use some Nuln oil. This is the new formula, I think. The pot seems smaller than they were before. Not sure why that is. I then use a big old brush and wash it all over the base. Again, I'm trying my best not to get it on the armour. You can see here, I have my wash in a pot holder. Nobody wants to be spilling their Nuln oil. It's expensive and it makes a mess. It's horrible. With the Nuln oil wash applied, we have this. 
Sadly, there's a lot of wash on there, so we have to wait for it to dry. Only a couple of weeks, usually. Now, you can use a hairdryer to speed drying times along, but sometimes I find it causes things to dry a bit funny. So I just give them all the time they need now, and it's a lot. Okay, let's make some blood. To make blood, we need two ingredients. Tamiyar Clear Red and some Yoohoo Glue. It's always happy to see you this glue. Yoohoo! First we apply some of the Yoohoo Glue into a little pot. Be careful as it's horrible stringy stuff. It tends to go everywhere and once squeezed it just doesn't stop coming. Then we add a couple of drops of Tamiyar Clear Red to it. Start with only a couple of drops and just add more to taste. Don't actually taste it though, taste is in preference. After a good stir, you have this. It reminds me of some of the scenes in Alien. My god, that was a good movie. And the inspiration for a lot of Warhammer 40,000's history, no less. Using this homemade gore, I then apply it to the claws of the close combat weapon. As it's stringy, you can wrap it around and make some cool effects. I also splattered some around the body and some more on the base. Now be careful as this stuff is weird. It will ruin your brushes immediately and I don't even know how you're supposed to clean it up. You probably need thinners if it's even possible to clean it in the first place. Once all the gore is applied, you have this. I think it looks bloody disgusting and I love it. Interestingly, the blood I had left in the pot congealed, so I also added that to the base. It's that bloody pulped mess on the floor. It looks like someone skinned a pig. It's rank, but it's right. Now, gore is a funny old thing on miniatures. It's a bit like weathering. Well, it is weathering, isn't it, really? A little goes a long way. And when you go too far, it just looks ridiculous. Well, to me, anyway. Oh, by the way, if you want to get your hands on your own Contemptor Dreadnought, there's a little link up here somewhere. This one, however, has even more options like an assault cannon or the best weapon in all of Warhammer 40,000, the Conversion Beamer. It's now the time to rim my Dreadnought. The best black for rimming I find is this, Scale Color 75 Black. It's really, really matte, like an old school poster paint. It's perfect. After some thinning, I then work my way around the miniature's rim smoothly and slowly. I always find it's best to take your time when you're rimming, as you don't want to make a big mess and have it dripping all around the edges. Now while I put my paints away, I just want to give a shout out to all my patrons and channel members. Dan Yallop, Lee Blackley, Donald, Pine Tree, Bobzilla, Charles Marlowe and Andrew Marrington. Thank you again so much and I love you all. Now before the final reveal, I just want you to have a little look at this, hold on. This is Rogue Trader, the original version of Warhammer 40,000. Now the Contempted Dreadnought on the back here, it's obscured by shadow, says on the side of the hull, if you're enjoying this video then please consider liking it and subscribing to the channel. That means you, Pat. Now if you are enjoying the content on this channel then please consider joining the Patreon, the link to which is in the description below or up here somewhere. And here's the results. My easy to paint Warhound or World Eater's Contemptor Dreadnought for the Horus Heresy. I have to say I really enjoyed painting this one, especially that gore, and I think the white and blue with the bloody red look well bloody lovely. I think next up on the Heresy train are the Terminators or maybe the Spartan, but time will tell. Please let me know what you would like to see next in the comments below. 
I'm always very interested in your opinions. Or, alternatively, just come and chat to us in Discord. The link is here somewhere. I think that's a lovely dreadnought. If you want to see some more videos in this Horus Heresy series, then check out the playlist up here somewhere. And as always, thank you very much for watching.